Good evening, this is Jim Miller welcoming you to another edition of Sports Watch. Don Jackson and I will be giving you all the news of the day in sports, a few commentary items, and of course we'll be taking your phone calls at 949-350. We'll be getting to the phone calls in just a few moments. The big news in the sports world today is that the Yankee pennant hopes were jolted severely when the Baltimore Orioles came from behind to defeat the Detroit Tigers this afternoon, 7-6 to six in a game in Detroit. Andy Etcherbaron doubled home Brooks Robinson in the top of the ninth to cap off the come-from-behind victory for the Orioles. It's the eighth victory in a row for Baltimore and the fifth win in their last 16 games. It's awfully tough to catch a club that's that hot. The Yankees have been doing rather well themselves. They've won eight out of their last ten during the stretch drive. Or at Milwaukee where it could snow tonight. Wonderful weather. The Yankees must win their last two games. and must hope that the Orioles lose in their game tomorrow at Detroit. It's a tough order and that's just for a tie. The Yankees will be throwing Doc Medich after his 20th victory tonight. Medich has lost 13 against Kevin Koble, the left-hander for the Milwaukee Brewers. Tomorrow is a move to an afternoon game just in case of the playoff at Shea on Thursday. It was originally scheduled as a night game, moved up to the afternoon. That'll be Pat Thompson against Jim Colburn. The Yankees, as I said, really, no matter what happens, have nothing to be ashamed of. They have won eight out of their last ten in the stretch drive and have played very, very fine ball over the last month and a half. In that National League race, Pittsburgh and St. Louis are still tied. Pittsburgh is home tonight against the Chicago Cubs with Jerry Royce pitching. St. Louis will send Bob Gibson against the Montreal Expos and Mike Torres up in Montreal. Again, the two teams tied with two games to go. Some of our callers last night will be very happy to learn that Joe McDonald, the director of the Mets minor league operations, has been named general manager of the club today to replace Bob Sheffing, who retired. Sheffing has come under a lot of criticism as the man who really let the Mets go downhill and caused the Mets a good deal of trouble. And, of course, Bob Sheffing will not be with us as general manager anymore. He's retired today, replaced by Joe McDonald. Both wire services report that Frank Robinson will be named the Cleveland Indians manager next week or this week. They're not not sure which one. When he's named manager and if Robinson will become a player manager, the first in the big leagues in some time, he'll remain as a designated hitter with Cleveland. He'll also keep his salary to about $180,000 a year, making him the highest paid manager in the history of baseball and, of course, the first black manager. One baseball game today, Minnesota beat Texas by a score of 6 to nothing. And in hockey today, the Soviet Union defeated Team Canada 3 to 2. Russia leads that series two games to one with two ties. Don Jackson is with us as usual, and Don has some thoughts on the World Football League. All right, Jim. 1974 marked the inception of the new game in town, the World Football League. The new league started its regular season with a 20-game schedule beginning in July. Along with this innovation came many others, such as the Dicker Rod, a measuring stick, stick which no one is capable of understanding, including the officials and the action point, which allows a team to score another point after a seven-point touchdown. But despite all of its innovations, the league is having many financial problems. These problems were indicated after the first real attendance of the first week were released, and these figures proved false. Uh, this makes one wonder about the credibility of the whole league. Of course, many people say that the first year is rough for any new league, and this is true to a certain extent. But the next question is, why is the new league failing so miserably? The first reason that comes to mind is the obvious lack of quality players. The teams are comprised of cast-offs from the NFL in most instances. There are some high-priced rookies, but too few to speak of. The second and probably most significant reason that the league is failing is that the fans across the country feel oversaturated with football. It is no secret to the knowledgeable fan that the owner is out in this business to make a buck. In this case, the owners are trying to push an inferior product, and the fans are simply not buying it. I, and I have to admit that I am glad. It's a good feeling to know that the fans won't watch just any quality of football simply because it's there. Yes, I think the New World Football League will go under, and I can't say that I'm too sorry to see it go. Jim? All right, I'm sure we'll have some comments on that, and I can say myself, I don't know if it's going to go under because of the stars that they have signed over the next couple of years, but it's going to be a rough road. There's no doubt about that. And speaking of rough roads in football, Columbia football is back on Channel 10 this coming weekend, and Columbia in what we could call a rebuilding season. We're not expecting the greatest results in terms of one loss, but with a new head coach in Bill Campbell, we are hoping to see some interesting action, and that game will be on Channel 10, the Princeton-Columbia game on Monday evening at 7 o'clock on both of your systems throughout Manhattan. Those of you in the Teleprompter area will also see the game on Saturday evening at 10 p.m., but everyone can see it Monday night at 7. Let's go to our phones now. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. Um, do you think that the Rangers might win the Stanley Cup? Like, um, I think they look good with Sanderson and uh, with uh, Jobert. 
They've looked very good early in the season, or early in the preseason, we could really say, but it's way too early to start thinking about a uh, Stanley Cup victory. I think the Rangers have a shot at it, and they've looked to have a certain hustle and aggressiveness that they've been lacking in the past, Don. I think that's the exact point, Jim. We'll just have to see how much the Rangers have progressed in terms of their aggressiveness and whether or not they can really go out and be hungry for the Stanley Cup and really want it bad enough. Also, um, the um, rain... Well, Go on. Yeah, we're here. Also, the uh, Yankees, they only have two games, and they're one and a half games back, and I don't think they can catch up that easily, so Baltimore will probably be able to play the A's, and do you think Baltimore might go all the way? I think the way they're pitching right now, they have to have a chance at it. Uh, they just seem to be unbeatable. But their pitching has let down the last couple of games. They gave up six runs today to the Tigers. I think they gave up six runs yesterday. So I think if they don't get the pitching, they can't do it. They've been getting the hitting against Detroit, which does not have a particularly good pitching ball club at this time. But I'd have to rate the A's the favorites right now. Thanks for calling. Thank you very much. Good evening. You're in Sports Hi. Watch. I like to talk about Doug Sanderson joining the Rangers. Okay. Well, I want to think that, you know, people saying that he shouldn't be on the range. I'm saying if he's on your team, you should respect him. Now, people don't believe that, and I think, you know, if someone's on a range of team, if you're rooting for a range of team, and someone joins, you should, you know, cheer, cheer him and hope that he goes for the team. Well, I, I, don't, I think that's a rare... Uh, uh, instance that the uh, Ranger fan would dislike Sanderson. I think he's become an immediate hit with the fans here in, in New York, and uh, they love him. He had his first fight last night, and he scored another goal, and he's been doing very well, and I'm sure any true Ranger fan has to really love Derek. I think the reaction's been pretty favorable to him so far. I'd have to agree there, too. Okay? Thanks for calling. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. Yeah, do you know who leads the National League in shutouts this year? Not That's really. Question. That's not a bad question. Uh, don't have it at the tip of my tongue. Could be Messer Smith. Uh, I don't know. Though. He usually doesn't go all the way. Mike Marshall usually comes in. So I really have no idea. I have to admit that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. All right, that question that, play, that person just asked, uh, the leading shutout hitter, that leading shutout pitcher was uh, John Matlack. John Matlack. Yeah, How right. about that? Yeah, Mets, Mets are leading in something, at least. Well, that's good to know. I like to ask your views on um, Frank Robinson being the first black manager. Well, I'm personally glad to see it, and I think that uh, from everything I know about Robinson and everything I've read about him, he is eminently qualified to be a manager, and I think some of the things that people are trying to emphasize is that he is the first manager and that he's being the first black manager and he's being chosen because of his qualifications for being a manager. And I think Cleveland's a good place for it. It's a large black population. Larry Doby was the first black ball player in the American League back in 48, I think, a year after Jackie Robinson broke in. And I think it's a place where it'll be accepted very well. And I'm happy to see it. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I don't know personally if there's going to be some problems in the Cleveland club, such as with Gaylord Perry, things like that. But I think they'll straighten things out. Uh, um, all right, thank you. And I'm thank a coos. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. Yes, uh, I would like to make some comments on uh, Don's comments about the uh, WFL. Okay. Fine. Glad to hear them. Okay. Uh, I don't agree with you that the WFL is going to fold. I think like any any new league, they're going to have problems at the beginning, such as the AFL had when uh, they broke in. Of course, they got cast off from the NFL, and eventually, years later, they merged with them. Well, I, I think the main problem with this league, though, is that you see that the... Uh, Houston team is moving uh, from Houston to Shreveport, Louisiana, I believe, and that's moving from a prime TV area where they get great coverage into an area where there's virtually no TV coverage. What I'm saying is the indication so far from the league, even though it is a league in its first year, that it's not making any strides for, for, forward. It's, instead, it's going down. Now, the same thing with the New York Stars moving out, moving from New York. It's going to be a, a big question whether or not this league can survive without a New York team. And... Uh, I think the fact that they've trumped up the attendance figures and that the Stars could not draw anybody in New York is, is, is an indication of the league having many problems. Well, I think eventually, eventually we'll have a New York team again from the WFL, and I think it's just the uh, uh, beginning turmoil of the new league, and I think that uh, with, with all the stars it's going to get from the, from the NFL, and they are getting big stars, especially from the championship teams, such as uh, Miami, they're getting 
Foley, Kuchenberg, and of course. Now, I have to. I have to agree with you. I think that they've had a lot of problems this year, and I don't think they're going to go under like Don said. The other point I have to raise, and this is an answer mm -hmm. to you, and I hadn't heard your piece before you read it either, but uh, and that is that the ABA has managed to survive despite the right. fact that they are really in rather bad television markets themselves too. Mm -hmm. I think that the New York team. One of the reasons that the New York team never drew was because they were playing at Randall's Island as much as the quality. Of, I'm not saying if they were at Yankee right. Stadium, I don't think they'd have drawn more than 15 or 20 thousand. Right. I agree with you also in the fact that we are being saturated with with uh, right. a lot of football, but I think I think this will pass. I really do. I also like to make another comment mm -hmm. about uh, Ralph Houck. I think uh, I think he's managing uh, the way he managed in New York. He's uh, afraid to make decisions, and it's evident. And uh, I think he's making uh, uh, poor judgments. Uh, something that a novice manager, I think, would. Uh, would make or wouldn't even make. I think uh, that time pitching to uh, Tommy Davis and today again, I just don't think Detroit is that bad of a ball club. Well, I'm not surprised that Detroit has done badly because I think they're an aging club I and I think that. actually I predicted them for fifth or sixth place early, one of the few things that came out right, I guess you could say. But I'm not surprised that they're doing badly. As far as Hauk goes, I think he's really suffering by comparison to Bill Verdon because Hauk just say, stayed static over all these years, refused to make a move at second base and shortstop and some of the other places. And Verdon, doing as well as he is, is really making Hauk look bad, I think. True, sure. It's a good, uh, it's a good point. Thank you very much. Thanks for calling. Good evening, you're in Sports Watch. Yeah, um, I'd like to talk to you about a couple of trades that, that could, could very easily happen. The first involves the uh, New York Mets and the Expos. Uh, I read in the uh, paper a few weeks ago that Rusty Staub would like to go back to Montreal. Mm -hmm. I also read that Willie Davis would like to leave Montreal. Now, the Mets need a center fielder, and the Expos could use Staub. What would you think if the Mets traded Staub for Davis? I think it's too much to give up. Staub's a lot younger than Davis, and that's the major factor. I think Davis is about 35 or so, and right. Staub is maybe 29 or 30. Staub's got his best years or good years ahead of him still. The age factor is the main difference there. Do you really think he's got good years ahead of him? I mean, he's going down from a 300 hitter who had 30 homers to a 260 hitter with 20. Well, he's, he's had a lot of problems with injuries, I think, that have really hurt him. I don't think they'd want to go out and get Willie Davis because of his age, and I, I think the Mets really have to look for a younger player. As Jim said, maybe last night Bobby Bonds might become available. Now that's a player they should really go after and maybe give up one of their uh, pitchers for him. Yeah, right. And then in the football, the Giants, now they looked impressive against Dallas, but before the Dallas game, everybody was saying they need a quarterback. Well, I th still, still think they need a quarterback. Yeah. Okay, well, what about uh, something like Ron Johnson for Terry Bradshaw? Ron Johnson for Terry Bradshaw. It's an awful lot to give up. Again, I, now I'll tell you something else. I don't think Bradshaw is very good. I don't care what his statistics are. I think he was the problem with the Steelers over the last two years. He's inconsistent. I've, he's better than Snead. There's no doubt about that. Ron Johnson might be a little too much to give up for Bradshaw. Maybe. And I'd like to make just one comment on okay. the Frank Robinson, Gaylord Perry situation. I think that was really blown out of proportion because Perry's remarks had to do with salary and Right. Alone and right. Didn't look at it that way. I'm well, I have to think Perry was wrong in what he did. Uh, what he basically did was he went around publicly saying, I want to make one dollar more than Frank Robinson. And what Robinson said is, fine, use me and say that if you want, but say it privately, not publicly. He's bringing Robinson into a situation that really Frank has nothing to do with. And I don't blame Robinson for being annoyed at that particular situation. I hope it was blown out of proportion. I'd like to see Gaylord stay with Cleveland. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. Yes. Oh. Uh um, uh, the fellow right in front of me took the question about Gail Perry and Frank Robinson. Mm -hmm. um, but I would like to ask another one about uh, the upcoming fight between Muhammad Ali and George. Good topic. <laughs> George, well, um, if it occurs. Yeah, right. Uh, I read in the paper recently that... stepped out of our picture for a moment and sitting to my right is the new head coach of the Columbia football team, Bill Campbell. And as we've said a couple of times over the last couple of days, we'll be on with the first Columbia football telecast. Columbia's at Princeton this Saturday. The game will be on at 10 p.m. on Saturday night in the teleprompter area and for all of Manhattan at 7 p.m. on Monday evening. And Bill has come right over from the practice field across the street and I really want to thank you for dropping by and just want to talk to you for a couple of moments and give the fans a chance to meet you. I know what an energetic and enthusiastic head coach you are and let some of them see it too. Tell us a little bit about your own background, Bill, before coming to Columbia. 
Well, before coming back to Columbia this time, Jim, I was at, uh, I've been at Boston College for the last six years. Uh, before that, I had coached at Columbia then with uh, Buff Dinelli. Of course, I went to school here at Columbia, graduated in 1962. I stayed here and coached the freshman, then coached the varsity, then the second year, went in the service for two years, came back, coached at Columbia two more, and then I was at Boston College for the last six. And we should add that Bill Campbell was the captain of the last Columbia Ivy League championship team back in 61 when Buff Dinelli was the head coach. What about your squad this year, your first year as head coach? You have said publicly it's not a particularly good football team. Tell us briefly about it. Well, Jim, you know, we've got a lot of work to do to try to make this a good football team. I, I think from, we're a long way from it, as evidenced by our performance on Saturday. I was rather disappointed in our performance overall, uh, though defensively I think we played uh, rather well. In fact, good enough to win that game. But offensively, our, our performance was, you know, to, to say the least, it was disappointing. I, a lot of people have blamed it on the rain and the weather conditions and the fact that they had two games, but uh, I've got to face it. Uh, you know, we're not that good a football team. We did not execute at all. And in fact, I was just, uh, you know, very disappointed in the way we performed. Have you been working well in practice this week as the team seem to be bouncing back and ready for Princeton, which is always a big traditional rivalry? Very well. I, the boys had a, we had a, in fact, I just got off the practice field now. We had a very good practice, and I think, we're, I think we'll get better. How much better it's possible for us to get, I really don't know, but I think we're capable of playing much better than we uh, exhibited on Saturday. Bill, one more question. What about the Princeton game this coming Saturday? Princeton is also a rebuilding team. They went 1-8 and eight last year, and Columbia was 1-7-1. and one. Does it look to be a fairly even game, or how do you see it? Well, I hope that we can improve in another year the way Princeton has from one year to the next. They've, they've done a great job with their program in, in turning it around in a year. They, they were very competitive with, uh, with Rutgers, and in fact, you know, the controversial game minus the goalposts, et cetera, they, they should have won the game. But... Uh, they're very good. They've got one of the two best running backs in the leagues in, in, in this league in Snichtenberger. And, uh, you know, defensively, they're very, very strong. Schlack, the defensive tackle, is as good as there is in this league. But they're, they're a good football team, and I just hope that we can compete with them on Saturday. Bill, I really want to thank you for coming over here after practice and know you can get right back to work now. And we'll be looking for you on the sidelines this Saturday and throughout the course of the season. And I'll take a phone call while you unhook yourself and let Don Jackson get back in the picture. Thanks very much. Thank and you very if much. If anyone Jeff. can bring Columbia back, I know it's going to be you. Thank you very much. Okay. Good evening. You're in Sports Watch. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Emily Ward. Uh, I would like to know if they're going to keep Yogi Bear for the Mets this year. Could you repeat the question? I just couldn't quite hear you. I wonder if they're going to keep Yogi Bear as the manager. Keep Yogi Bear. I think so. Yogi just signed a three-year contract before the season started. It's been a tough year. There's no doubt about that. And I don't think Yogi has managed a particularly great year, but I don't think you can blame it on him either. Uh, it's my guess that he's going to stay around with the Mets, at least for next year. I think they might let him go after two years of the contract, but I think he'll be around for next year at least. What do you say? Yogi. I think they, they really like Yogi in New York. I think uh, we might see a change with Sheffing gone now. Sheffing was very lax, and I don't think he stayed too much in touch with Yogi. I think they might uh, make Yogi account a little more now that uh, with the new GM, they want to make sure that the Mets continue to have progress. Okay. Oh, that's good. And another thing, can you remember whether Sandy Koufax ever pitched at Shea Stadium and against the Oh, sure. He pitched against the Mets many times over at Shea Stadium and had some very fine games in those games, too. Okay. Thanks for calling. Don, you've got a piece on the Nick game coming up, and we get to watch Bill Walton. Don? Yes, I do. And, yes, we are going to see Bill Walton. And I think we're going to see a very interesting game between... in this game by a narrow margin. Jim? And we're just about out of time. We'll be back next Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Remember Columbia football this weekend. For Don Jackson, this is Jim Miller. Thanks for joining us.